In order to get this performance-based question correct, you need to know attacks and remediations really well. Now on test day, you're gonna see something like this with this crazy big long drop-down list. For the sake of the video explanation, I simplified it and changed the format just so we can walk through the attacks and remediations in more detail. So let's jump to our first scenario. Now an approach I like to take is to not get overwhelmed by all of these answer choices and options down here. I like to think about the scenario first and try to predict the right answer. So when you have an attacker that's sending multiple SIM packets from multiple sources, what type of attack is that? Well, that's a SIN flood. So let's go see if that's one of our answer choices. And it's not. Don't panic. What's the goal of a SIN flood, especially when it's targeting a web server? It's trying to knock the server offline. So that is a type of denial of service attack. More specifically, if it's coming from multiple sources, that actually tells you it's a distributed denial of service attack. And that, by the way, makes sense, right? Because you need multiple computers to, to carry out a SIN flood because when the server responds with its SIN acts, that traffic has to go somewhere. It has to be distributed across multiple sources. So let's go look for DOS or DDoS, and that's not an answer choice. Okay, now what? Well, now we can just start reading, and I read botnet, and I realize a botnet is the technology that you as the attacker need to carry out a SIN flood. So that is our sort of third best answer choice here, but it's the only one that sort of makes sense. So a botnet is like a collection of zombie or army computers that's going to be infected by malware that's going to carry out actions remotely usually on behalf of the attacker. So in the SIN flood, a botnet's just sending a whole bunch of illegitimate SIN requests to our web server. So we have botnet, and then how are we going to stop it? Well, again, try to predict the right answer. To stop a SIN flood, you can do something like a flood guard, which basically monitors the amount of like half open connections, and it's gonna block illegitimate incoming SIN request. But that doesn't look like that's an answer choice. And what I'm realizing is they're going for something way more broad. We have enable DDoS or distributed denial of service protection. That's a umbrella term that would include ways to prevent a SIN flood specifically. So we're feeling pretty good about the first one. We're ready for our next scenario. So in this next scenario, we have a self-propagating attack. Let's stop reading right there. What do you know? What attack method or vector is self-propagating? It's a type of malware. I'll give you a hint. That's right, a worm. So a worm is a type of malware that's self-propagating, meaning it spreads automatically. And usually it can do that by jumping through the network, through networking protocols or even well-known credentials. And it can sort of move around the network and it doesn't need a host by contrast like a virus does. So I read self-propagating and I think the right answer is worm. Now, how do we prevent a worm or take an action on it? Well, the best option here is to be thinking about, well, let's not get worms in the first place, right? Let's think about ways to, to stop malware from coming on or sort of spreading. But the issue with my sort of worm specific approach is that there's no real good answer choice here that has to do with like anti-malware. So I keep reading the scenario and it, I'm realizing it says it's compromising a SQL database specifically using well-known credentials as it moves through the network. So if we can't actually prevent this, how are we going to remediate it? Well, since it's focusing on well-known credentials, a good way to stop it is to focus on a remediation that has to do with passwords or credentials. So there's actually two that stand out to me. We have change the default system password or change the default application password. Very tricky, sounds similar. And the only difference is where you're changing the password. Is it the system or the application? I'll give you a second to think about what you think the right answer is. To weigh the two options against each other, I would first think about, okay, what is a system password? What are they talking about by systems? Well, a system usually refers to like the default operating system level system accounts, like your admin, root, things like that, versus the default application password. That is a password that's specific for an application or service. So ask yourself, is this SQL database more likely to be at the system level 
or an application level. That's right, it's the application. A SQL-based database is more likely to be an online application like a SQL server system or something like that. So we need to change the admin credential for that application. The right answer is application because it fits more specifically with the SQL database. Change of the system password level probably won't stop a worm from targeting the SQL service login. It's kind of hanging out in different worlds. We're ready for the next one. In this next scenario, we have an attacker that establishes a connection which allows for remote commands to be executed. What does that mean? Well, in its simplest form, an attacker is basically remotely controlling a victim's computer. So how can attacker actually remotely control a victim computer where they can carry out commands on behalf of the user. Well, there's a type of malware that allows this to happen and it's right there, remote access Trojan. So when you see remote commands, think remote access and basically more specifically, the malware that we're looking for is a rat. It can be used for a lot of malicious, nefarious purposes. You can do surveillance, data theft, other you know, further system compromise if the attacker is trying to move laterally. But the point is, it allows the attacker to remotely control the victim's computer. So rat is the attack. Let's think about how to prevent or remediate it. So my initial instinct was actually to match up this remote access concept with a rat and in the question, therefore the remediation being disabling remote access services. But then I realized something. Just because the names sort of match up with remote access and remote access Trojan doesn't necessarily make this the best answer choice. What I mean by that is when we do disabling of remote access services, think about that as a larger context of like system hardening or network hardening. So when we do that, we prevent legitimate remote access connections that we just don't need. A great example of this might be shutting down Telnet. It's a service that we don't need, it's insecure, so we disable it and we shut it down. But if we were to do something like that, it actually wouldn't help address the root cause of the rat. Remote access service disabling is like a preventative configuration uh, type level hardening control. It's actually not a dynamic detection or response tool. And when we have a nasty piece of malware, we actually need something that can more dynamically detect block and alert on rat activity. So is there another answer choice here that actually will give us that ability to more dynamically detect and block? Well, one really good option I see here is a host-based IPS. So the host-based part makes sense because we're targeting the user, so we can put it on the user's machine. And then the IPS is intrusion prevention system. So that's gonna allow you to both monitor and analyze system level behavior in real time. And then the detection piece can identify unusual patterns, like for example, a backdoor communication, which is very typical of how a rat actually works. And then you get the prevention or the response where it can automatically block or alert on rat activity. So the fact that the host-based IPS allows you to do prevention, detection, and response versus remote access services is more you know, a configuration level protection, but once the rat is installed, is not gonna address it, tells me the right answer is the host based IPS. Now we're ready for our next scenario. So this one talks about an actual piece of hardware, but it's allowing the attacker to remotely monitor a user's input. So we're looking for something that is maybe physically sort of tapped in to the user's keyboard, for example, that is then going to report back to the attacker so they can monitor the user's input. If you don't know like what the right answer is, it doesn't jump out at you. Think about it. Which one of these actually will use hardware? Well, a lot of this is sort of software based, but there's one thing here that in some ways you can feel and you can touch, and that is a keylogger. 
So a keylogger is a hardware-based physical monitoring device. So sometimes, you know, you see it as like a USB or even a malicious keyboard itself. And the whole idea is to monitor input. And in this scenario, they're doing it so they can steal credentials. So what is a good way to prevent against this type of attack? Well, since they called out harvesting credentials in the stimulus, that is sort of a hint that maybe the answer choice is gonna revolve around some sort of credential or password protection. So then I said, okay, great. Well, maybe we finally go back to actually the system password and changing passwords. But then I realized if the attacker has a keylogger, they'll actually be able to capture and see the changed or the updated password. So that really updating the password isn't gonna help us. So the other thing that's password related is two-factor authentication using push notification. Let's set aside the push notification for a second. Let's just talk about multi-factor or two-factor authentication. So why this actually makes sense is because a keylogger can actually steal a password. It's gonna capture the input, but it can't actually access or replicate the second factor. So especially if we have something like a, the fancy word is out of band authentication, like a push to a mobile device, the push notification actually requires the user to physically approve the login, for example, on their phone. So that's gonna to be totally outside of the world of the keylogger. Now, granted, the keylogger still has the user's password in this scenario, but they may not be able to actually use that password if there's a second factor. So we sometimes call this breaking the attack chain, right? You have the username and password as the attacker, but you can't log in without the second factor. Okay, now we're ready for our fifth and final attack scenario. Let's do it. So this one seems to be focusing on an application specifically, and the attacker is actually embedding hidden access in an internally developed application that bypasses account login. So when I think about attackers messing with applications, a couple things come to mind. The first one is actually a logic bomb because in order for a logic bomb to work, an attacker has to mess with the inner workings of an application and also a backdoor. So I'm choosing between those two. And when you think about a logic bomb, basically what happens is there's malicious code that gets triggered by specific conditions or events, but it's not. It's gonna lay dormant until it's triggered. So it might say, okay, on January 1st, do this malicious destructive thing. But there's no talk about that in the actual scenario. Specifically, what's going on is bypassing authentication. So a better answer for that that addresses it directly is a backdoor. A backdoor, just what it sounds like, it's a hidden method of bypassing normal authentication or security controls, usually installed by a developer, which just seems like it was happening in this scenario since it was internally developed. But it can also be you know, by, by an, an attacker or there could actually be malware that installs a backdoor. But since it talked specifically about bypassing authentication, Authentication, the right answer is backdoor. Now, how are we going to prevent backdoors? Well, think about this. Since the backdoor is actually built into the application, you can't see it with firewalls or scanners. So you actually need to get in there and manually inspect the source code or use tools that do you know, static code analysis to detect a backdoor. So the best answer choice here is conducting a code review. A code review basically allows security teams to look at and spot and detect any unauthorized logic. So you might have, you know, a actual hidden bypass or maybe undocumented API or hard-coded credentials that you can actually pick up and look at if you're doing the actual code review. Another answer choice that I was drawn to was actually the one below it, which is application fuzzing. Now, after I described the right answer being code review, you're probably like, well, why are you thinking about fuzzing? But I got drawn to the word application because that's the target of it. But application fuzzing is actually like stress testing the application and it doesn't have to do with the backdoor. We care about the performance of the application. So I just wanted to call that one out just in case you were thinking uh, along the same lines as I was, but the right answer here is a code review because it's going to allow you to spot a backdoor. 
Wow. Okay. That was our fifth and final attack scenario for this performance-based question. I know these can feel exhausting, but thanks for sticking in there with me as I thought out loud. My, I just want to leave you with one piece of advice for a question like this. Well, I said one piece of advice, two, I can't help myself. First of all, slow down to speed up, meaning rather than get overwhelmed by all this stuff down here, focus on this type of thing up here. Focus on the stimulus, try to predict the right answer. The second piece of advice I have for you is don't spend too much time on each one of these PBQs. If you really are short for time, what you could do is think about the attacks. If you like knowing the attacks is actually easier than knowing the prevention or remediation. So for each of the five, get those right because there's partial credit on the PBQ and then do your best by matching up the prevention or the or the remediation action. But at a minimum, you can get the attacks right. So think about that as you go through. Thanks for sticking with me in this long video. I'll see you in the next one.